There are lots of videos that talk about new releases and features in Home Assistant, and I've made a few of those as well. That talks about all the shiny, fun stuff, but what it doesn't talk about is the underlying operating system. So today I want to do a quick update on Home Assistant Operating System 10, version 10. So let's get right into it. Before we actually get into the features of Home Assistant Operating System version 10, let me just remind you about the installation methods that Home Assistant has. There are four different types of installation methods, and there, there are probably a couple more, but these are the main ones. The Home Assistant uh, Operating System is the OS that we're talking about today. It's a minimal operating system. It's designed to power Home Assistant, it comes with Supervisor, which is a big one and it allows you to use core and add-ons. This is the recommended installation method. This is the one I use. There's also the Home Assistant container, which is a standalone type installation, something like Docker. In addition, there's a couple of more, more uh, complex methods of installation. You can install a Home Assistant supervisor manually, and then you can um, install the Home Assistant core in a virtual, uh, Python virtual environment. So. We're talking about Home Assistant operating system today, and those are the features that we'll talk about. If you want to compare the methods down here, here are the different things that you can do with these different types of installations. The OS version is the one we have, and basically all of these are checked. If you wanted to use the container method, such as Docker, you would have no supervisor, no add-ons, uh, and none of the restore and manage OS. And then of course, these other uh, methods as well. So let's talk about what's in Home Assistant OS 10. One of the big things that caught my eye and why I'm making a video on this release now is that we now have new board support for the hard kernel Odroid M1. It's a single board computer, runs about $70 US for the four gig version and $90 US for the eight gig version. It has NVMe SSD storage natively, and then it has a quad core CPU up to two gig of uh, gigahertz and then a gig of memory, as I said. It's suitable for even the most demanding Home Assistant installations. If you're running on a Raspberry Pi or something like that, and you're having issues with slowness or capacity memory, whatever, this is a good board for you to replace it with because uh, it's about, if you were buying a Raspberry Pi kit, it's about similar in price to a Raspberry Pi kit. Of course, you need to buy the power supply and some extra things with this Odroid, but still for 70 to $90, you have a very robust Home Assistant system that is low power consumption, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so I think it makes a great uh, single board computer for running Home Assistant. Now, so, so Home Assistant can be booted off of an SD card or an eMMC. There is new boot firmware, Petaboot, if you want to boot from eMMC. And there's specific board information documentation that talks about it. If you do want to boot from the eMMC, you need to download and install the Petaboot. And it talks about this on the site here. I'll link all this down below here. And it's also on my blog post for this same uh, video. So there's that. Let's talk about the, the device itself for a minute. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but you can see quite a few different things that they highlight on the board. A couple things here, got a mono speaker output. You also have a headphone jack. Uh, if it has a microphone, which I don't know if it has a microphone, it may be possible in the future to do something with uh, voice control, you know, Home Assistant's doing Year of the Voice this year, and there's a lot of effort on making local voice control available to uh, us for this. So hopefully we'll be able to utilize some of that. It's got a, a rock chip CPU, uh, LPDDR4 RAM, of course, all these other things that are on here. And you can read about it on the blog post here or on their website here, hardkernel.com. Uh, the CPU has four ARM Cortex-A55 processors, low power consumption, even at two gigahertz. Uh, it has eight gig of LP DDR4 RAM available. If you want to do that, you can buy either model. And like I talked about, Petaboot says it's pre-installed here, but you need to follow through and make sure that you install it the way it's talked about here so that it works for booting off the NV or the EMMC. All right, let's go down here a little ways with it. Uh, what I want to talk about on this side site is the, um, oh wait, before we do that, let's talk about storage. Let's go back up here and see what we have for storage. Um, you can put NVMe storage device installed on the Odroid board. Uh, it's PCI 3.02 lane configuration. It's super fast. Um, so remember or note that M.2 storage devices are not uh, able to be used on this. 
it appears only as a PCIe interface. Okay, so if you want to do this, don't use M.2. Use uh, use NVMe or EMC. Uh, you get a metal case option if you want to buy the metal case. Uh, and this is the one I want to talk about here. Here's the uh, power consumption and heat characteristics. Without any external peripherals connected, the M1 power consumption is about four and a half watts with a very heavy computing load. In idle mode, it can be as low as 1.3 watts. So that means that you can run this thing without worrying about an expensive power bill and just run it with a very heavy load all the time. And you have great um, power consumption characteristics for that. And you can see here, they talk a little bit about power consumption during the boot process for uh, Ubuntu GNOME desktop. So it goes through the whole booting process and then it drops down to about average idle power mode of about 1.3 watts. And then for temperature, there is a huge heat sink on the frame. The thermal characteristics are very good with a very heavy computing load. The core temperature was nearly 50 degrees Celsius with heavy computing at a relatively high 35 degree ambient temperature, which uh, is very far from uh, the actual throttle trigger point so that it won't trigger and um, throttle down during this heavy computing period. Even 35 degrees is pretty warm in an environment such as a climate controlled house or something like that. So this, I don't think you really have to worry about anything unless you're running this in a garage or attic somewhere where it gets super hot. So they talk about the stereo uh, and analog sound quality. If you wanna play or, or play around with that, you can look at that and read through it here on their, their website. Um, and a bunch of videos talking about all kinds of different uh, stuff here. And then of course the specifications you can get into all the way down here at the bottom of the page. So that is the um, that is the Odroid M1. Uh, if you're in need of a platform to run Home Assistant on, you're just starting out, you're trying to upgrade from a Raspberry Pi or something like that, give us a shot. See what it see what it'll do for you. Okay, so that's one of three things I want to talk about within the Home Assistant OS update. A couple other smaller things uh, are is the improved data disk feature. It allows you to extend storage by adding external disk. I have done that before. I run my uh, I run a Raspberry Pi and I move my data disk off the SD card onto an external drive so I wouldn't keep bashing that SD card and eventually destroying it. And I also got a lot more space when I did that, something like a terabyte, which is way overkill for Home, for home Assistant, unless you're gonna run cameras or something on the Home Assistant itself and need some storage. Uh, all commonly read and written data is moved to that data disk. The only thing that stays on the SD card or EMC or wherever you're booting from is the OS itself, which is read only. So that means that the only time they get written to is if there is a software update and that limits the, um, the wear and tear on your SD or EMC cards. This um, data disk now lists a model along with the type of data disk so that you can select the appropriate one. It also helps identifying more reliably disks that you can use as data disks. One of the coolest things I think that they've added here now is the ability to move your data disk. So what you can do is just select a different data disk and move everything over to that data disk. So if you've already done it once, and for some reason you wanna use a different disk for your data disk, move it over doing the same dialog, come back in a few minutes and now you're running on the new data disk. So you can just keep transferring disk the disk all day long if you want to. And finally, there's some advanced memory management. The, uh, they've moved from ZRAM to ZSwap. You can see that here. Uh, you can use the storage now as actual swap space. And then if the memory has been tuned to minimize the number of writes to storage, again, to help so, um, those SD cards and EMC survive a little bit better, a little bit longer. The reliability and responsiveness is better in low memory situations. So Home Assistant OS uses a new memory management mechanism called multi-gen LRU, along with some thrashing prevention. So if there is a low memory situation that you end up with on your Home Assistant instance, it can recover better and remain responsive in a better way uh, compared to what it, was, what it was in the past. And now always they recommend using a board with at least a gig of memory. If you use the Odroid M1, you've got four for a minimum, eight for a maximum. Uh, stay below that 80% memory utilization. And we can look at that over here if we go to system settings hardware, and then you'll see the memory utilization pop up here in just a couple of seconds. And you can tell how much processor you're using 
4% here, and I'm using 2.6 gig of the four gig. So as I load this page up, I'm about 70%, but then it drops back down. Now, if we take a look at comparing before and after for the memory, here is before I upgraded to Home Assistant 10, this is my Home Assistant Blue, and this is the amount of memory that I'm currently running through my Home Assistant Blue. It's roughly about 75% or so, so it's getting up to that 80% level. If you jump over here now, and let's take a look at what it looks like after my uh, upgrade to Home Assistant 10, the memory now has dropped a little bit. It's not significantly um, large, but it is, it gives me a little bit more gap, maybe a 10% more gap in my memory uh, abilities or my memory capacity. So anyway, I think that uh, it does show that it does some improvements. And one of the other things to consider with Home Assistant in general is that Home Assistant continues to uh, make improvements like these. So you'll see newly supported hardware, updates to existing uh, operating systems, uh, and just general improvement overall. I think that Home Assistant by far, um, in terms of the number of integrations and usability and customization is the number one out there anywhere. I've used a few other types of systems before and they just don't cut it. Uh, some are very hard to use. Some are designed for industrial engineers to run. It just doesn't work as well as Home Assistant. Again, what drew me to doing the video is having that new support for the hard kernel Odroid M1 as a nice alternative for more heavy or heavier computing loads uh, on the Home Assistant platform that you're running. Let me know if you have any comments down below in the comments section. Yeah, and you can talk to me on Discord. If you would like to subscribe to the channel, I would really appreciate it. If you wanna support what I do, there's a number of ways you can do that through joining the channel, uh, through Patreon, through Ko-fi, et cetera, et cetera. Don't forget to check my blog. It's a companion to what I do here on the videos. Um, it's linked down below as well. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next video.